Avasti land lovers, I'm Pruitt, this is Captain Jim, and on today's web DM, we're gonna be talking about hard tack, we're gonna be talking about hoisting the main sails, and running out of oranges, getting scurvy, jerking off to extra curvy pieces of driftwood, and scaving off that skirt, stay, scaving. Sea rats. There's always sea rats. It's Pirate Adventures on web DM. <laughs> Set sails, hoist the main shaft thing. Yes, the yard arm and the boat swain. No, it's a bosun. They got the whistle yeah. with, the, with, the, with the ball. Yeah. The cup the ball whistle. <laughs> <laughs> We're talking about pirate campaigns, right? This is a subject that has popped up. Yes. People, people want to know. They want to know how to sail the ships. And they want to know how to sail the ships. They're interested in pirates. Pirates are, are you are. know, they're a thing. Yes. They are. They are. Oh, God, we can't do that. No, we did it. No, it's already done. <laughs> we did. Because we're pirates and we don't care. Because that's, just... that's part of being a pirate, right? That you live in your own being, life. It is part of being a pirate. When I think of pirates, of course, there's the age of sail, post-war of Spanish succession, sort of like prolificity of pirates in the in the. Of course, everybody knows pirates. that. Jim. Everybody knows that. It's the pirates of the Caribbean pirates, right? Oh, uh, right. right, right. But that's not the only like. What kind of pirates are we talking about when we talk about a pirate campaign? Because yeah. there's other sort of historical eras to draw inspiration from. There's other sort of fictional sources we can draw inspiration from. Yeah, you don't have to just be be pigeonholed into right. Jack Sparrow stepping off of the the, the freaking you crow's do not nest have to be. and and stumbling around like and, your drunken Keith Richards, which right. is I don't understand is redundant, but <laughs> but it's how they it's how they portrayed. The first yeah. Pirates of the Caribbean movie is a fun movie, right? Like, yeah, I haven't seen any of the others. Yeah, uh, well. I, no, it seemed like they went off the, after the deep end. Yeah, yeah. After after the first one, they pretty much went off the deep end. Right. Yeah. But the first one's a great like, example of what you can kind of get up to in a pirate campaign. And I think like there's other areas. Vikings are pirates, right? They use boats to raid up and down the coastline and the rivers of, of, of continental Europe, and and they did that for you know a couple centuries before uh, they stopped. Right. There yeah. are the stories of Japanese pirates raiding the, the Chinese and Korean coastlines. There's yeah. the, where there is maritime trade, there is piracy. And so you have a, a wealth of historical references to draw from. Uh, it doesn't have to all be feathered hats and, and swashbuckling on, on the high seas. It can be something different. If you're looking yeah. for a nautical type campaign that features piracy and, and, and that kind of like lawlessness, yeah, um, is is something you can do. So I, I think like use finding your source of inspiration is going to be big. I think probably for most people they are thinking of the Age of Sail, yeah. pistols and cutlasses and oh yeah, you know walking all that the, kind of walking stuff. Walking the plank, walking the plank, and, eye patches and parrots. Right, and visiting Tortuga and we, we love video games on here on WebDM. We we play the hell out of them, and to me Black Flag is yeah, the, the Assassin, pirate Assassin's, Assassin's Creed. Creed Black Flag is yeah. the pirate game. To, to top all other pirate games. Like GTA on the high seas, kind of? Basically GTA on the high seas. And so I, I would draw a lot of inspiration from something like that, where, you know, have a setting where there's maybe a lot of islands, a lot of opportunities for you to sail your ship and, and, yeah. and move around. Um, it doesn't have to be a, you know, an archipelago or a, or a series of islands. It can be sort of a coast or, or I, I like the idea of like river pirate. Yeah, not high seas or anything. You're right. just on a boat. Maybe you're, you're even hiding out who you are. Right. You're constantly trying to deceive people. I mean, you're doing that as a pirate anyway, right? Take something like a river system like the Amazon or something like that and design your setting where that's oh, yeah. kind of the thing. And you can transport it to maybe a different, uh, you know, different terrain, different environment, but something like that extensive, that big. Yes, an insanely wide river, a lot of tributaries <laughs> coming in, a lot of curves. Right. Lots of places to hide and lots yeah. of places to stash your, your landing craft and, and get on board. So the pirate campaign that I'm thinking of, it has several sort of defining features of it. And yeah. you can replace the the, the cultural kind of trappings of them if you want but they always feature a ship of some kind right it's not a pirate campaign without a ship yeah whether that's a long ship <laughs> yeah i was gonna say how do you wh where do you start your your if you're the dm uh -huh. where do you start your party at do they have just like a, a long ship they got like a 15 foot long ship that can barely hold four people and that's right. where they start right. or do you give them something a little bit more this is the flip and dancer mm -hmm. you should start where your campaign is going totally to begin yeah, yeah if, you, <laughs> if you want your characters to be the officers on a large sailing vessel traveling the high seas engaging in piracy and trade and smuggling and all that other kind of stuff then start them there Right, uh, and just have it be established. Now you can sort of ease into it where they find their own ship. Tell them you're already a part of an established crew. You already have a ship. Then creating the ship 
and creating the crew becomes a part of the character creation process and they have a stake in it from the very beginning. Yeah. Or you can do sort of the opposite where very early on in the campaign or, or, or something you acquire a ship, they steal a ship, something, and maybe that's the way that they get their vessel and then they have to build up their crew. Um, that yeah, kind of thing. that sounds familiar. Yes, mm. it does sound familiar. Um, <laughs> maybe they inherit the ship. Maybe they're uh, crew members on the ship and there's a calamity or something and they take over leadership of it. Right, there's a storm or something or maybe right. they the first adventure is they go to, to, to hit a ship. Well, it was a setup. It was a setup, yeah. And two other ships come up. They barely make it out with their lives. Uh-huh. The ship's but, barely intact. Right, but the captain's dying. The first mate's uh, yeah. down. So that's sort of one way to kind of... Um, Start your campaign off, but I am really a proponent of if you're wanting to run a pirate campaign, Mm -hmm. if you're wanting to run a campaign that that features sort of nautical elements and everything else that that a pirate campaign entails, then start there. Okay. Uh, And if you're not, then get to it within like three adventures. Right, yeah, you You need to get on the high seas pretty quickly. Right. right? So once you are on the high seas, though, what what do the high seas... Behold, for oh, intrepid adventures. There's a lot of adventure to have out there, and right. I think that this is where I love Black Flag, yeah. uh, just because there is so much uh, inspiration you can draw just from this one source. But there's also a ton of other stuff. There's movies and and other video games, and of course, um, just you know, the historical examples of the real world. To me, the big one that I think of is is like it's obviously features a ship and sailing, and those are central elements to it. That right. most adventures are going to feature the characters on the ship, or or maybe the occasional where they get off and go on a landing party or, or shore leave or something, but the ship is sort of central to the campaign, and therefore, what are the kinds of things that you do on a ship? There's a lot of potential for NPC interactions and and sort of role-playing the daily life of the PCs on the ship and their crew members, mm-hmm. uh, whether the PCs are in charge, whether they have a captain that's an NPC, and just kind of like what's life like on the ship does present an opportunity to build up these sort of rich connections between the NPCs yeah. and the party members as you sort of describe sailing from place to place right. or, or doing what you're doing for more like action oriented stuff things that are more active and engaging and there's a whole host of stuff you can do you can hunt all of the various sea monsters <laughs> that are in the monster manual yeah, that you rarely gotta, get you gotta eat right you gotta eat and I, a lot of the sea monsters are very um, you know very high level dragon turtles and, and kraken and and things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but they don't have to be. You can create um, lower level versions of those things. You can use sort of the monsters like giant octopi and, and sharks and things like that as a basis for it. There's all those like mermaids and tritons and and marrow and aquatic trolls and aquatic elves. and <laughs> Right, sea devils. <laughs> Kuotoa. Um, Lathakwa. I think it's the uh, the other fish person. They're not in the fifth edition manual. Yeah, you have to go I, find them. Uh, I, I vaguely <clears throat> remember that. There's all of these aquatic Dungeons and Dragons monsters and, and NPC races that you could feature in a in a campaign. So let's say your pirate campaign, and you're you're sort of like freebooters and and privateers, and you're not quite pirates, but you're not quite the good guys. You know, your typical sort of Dungeons and Dragons party uh, on yeah. the high seas, having to deal with trade between various settlements and maybe the occasional piracy. Um, but also there's like a relationship with the underwater races that, yeah. uh, that live around there. And you, you add that extra depth be, by adding in, mm-hmm. by adding in all of the, uh, the stuff from the monster manual. Plus you open up the door for underwater adventures. And who right? doesn't love that, right? And who doesn't love that? And the occasional like, hey guys, we got to go visit the Triton city yeah. down, uh, down below and we're, we're anchored right above it. Yeah. And then you, everybody gets their water breathing cast on them. Yeah, Dawson uh, over here is going to cast water breathing on everybody. Right, it's going to take a few minutes. Uh, but we'll get it done. And then um, you know you dive down, and and I don't know. It's like now's the opportunity to play all of those class features, the swashbucklers, and the mariner fighting style, mm-hmm. and the sailor background, storm sorcerers, and sea sorcerers, and druids that are turning into various aquatic animals to swim through the ocean. All of these things that having a nautical themed uh, campaign, which we're just kind of generic calling a pirate campaign right. uh, that you get like, exploring unknown islands and the different kinds of ruins and 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 whatever it is that you find there mm-hmm. uh, raiding settlements uh, engaging in acts of piracy smuggling is another great one oh, yeah. um, I just think that like there's a, a whole wealth of opportunity to to feature different elements of the campaign and it also lends itself well to episodic play 
Yeah. Right. Let's say you're with a group that uh, can't meet very often, or you, you play with a large group and they always can't all be there, and so sometimes it's like three or four different people are there. But having a, a campaign where you're all part of a ship crew yeah. means that, okay, not everybody made it this week. Well, the away party consists of those of you who went, and you guys are on a dinghy, and you're you can mix and match who you, who you want. You don't, yeah, you don't need a you don't need a through storyline. I mean, you might have an overarching plot line, yeah. but you know, it, it was Spelljammer, but still, you're on a boat, right? Right. I mean, like it's what yeah. I tried to do with y'all is try to keep it as episodic as possible, self-contained stories. Those are just sort of like the elements that you can throw out there. There's also like the natural environment becomes a, a, a big part of yes. uh, the storms campaign. Storms aren't fun on a ship. Storms are not fun on a ship. Rogue waves, typhoons, hurricanes, mm-hmm. squalls, riptides. storms, riptides. I mean, there's <laughs> all these sorts of uh, hazards and, and, and environmental factors that you can throw in. And so like a, surviving a hurricane, playing that encounter out, having to deal with the wind and the rain and the waves... Mm-hmm. and making sure that your ship doesn't get too damaged. And those are all skill roles and the clever use of spells. Uh, you know, those physical characters with high dexterities and high strengths are going to shine in those situations. They're climbing, they're swinging, they're tying things down, they're yeah. rescuing fallen crew members who've gone underwater. Yeah, if that happens, that's when you're really <laughs> going to want that shifter druid. Right, right. You Go know, out there and become an octopus and wrap them <laughs> up. Wrap them up. Hang them on Bring back. them on back. What are the different races of a Dungeons & Dragons world look like when they engage, you know, when they engage each other on the high seas are you know what do orcs look like on yeah. the high seas what are elves and dwarves you seeing can dragonborn out on the high seas right seeing dragonborn i mean <laughs> having to deal with a dragon while you're on a ship uh would be another very <laughs> uh, difficult thing well there's not a lot of places to hide <laughs> no there's, right there's not a lot of places to hide you're really kind of a sitting duck you mentioned earlier about crew makeup right okay how much should a dm take into account the crew makeup from the beginning like that there's a captain and how would the players maybe feel about that right. you know what i mean like is that a possibility for conflict i think it's certainly a possibility for conflict i've run into a lot of players and i read a lot about a lot of players who don't like that kind of hierarchical structure within a uh, within the party itself they don't like having one party member being in charge of them or feeling like they're in charge of right. them. Right. So there are some options. You can go into a deep dive and be like, all right, I'm going to research actual officers on board a ship of the line and whatever, mm-hmm. and like what were their <laughs> ranks and names. Like, well, you might have a crew of 230 something officers. And, yeah. Or you could just go for the feel. Of, of a of a of a campaign. So think of like the the pirate crews that that uh, you know that sort of spring up to your mind. They're usually a captain and a first mate, and then just the crew. Right. You know. So maybe that captain is an NPC that is jointly controlled by everyone in the party, and then the part the players themselves take a step back and go, okay, here's what we are doing as a crew and have the captain speak that and then when they get down to their character then they sort of fill their their individual roles and that way everyone participates in being the captain in, yeah. in decision making therefore you know no player is lording it over another player or anything mm-hmm. like that in game there is still a captain npc who issues orders and does things it's just that the players are jointly in control of that npc that's right. one way to do it you could have sort of a situation like we did in the Spelljammer campaign i was going to be my next question how where, did y'all handle it where we were all captain uh it, Ex- i know except. that i know that emma will <laughs> contest that that she was the captain <laughs> from um, the beginning from the beginning i'm the captain right but we made decisions by consent Census, yeah. uh, and she was more the pilot than the captain. <laughs> yeah, there's a, there, just because you're holding the wheel doesn't make you captain, <laughs> right? right? <laughs> but I know she will vigorously and aggressively contest that. I think that's one way. The, by consensus amongst the, the party members yeah. uh, in character, this is what we're doing. Uh, that can work. Y'all led by committee, for I, sure. I think the other way is to just accept that, you know, yes, this character that's next to me, played by my fellow player, might be the captain. That's okay. Like, it, it, you, particularly if you trust the people you're playing with, yeah. you don't think they're going to screw you over. I mean, so much in Dungeons and Dragons is: are you playing with a random group of people at a local yeah. game store or online somewhere, versus friends you've known for years? Right. Your experience is obviously going to be different, no matter what kind of campaign, no matter what the party makeup. So, some things to consider: sort of roles for the for your crew. Obviously, captain is one. How you handle that uh, is going to be idiosyncratic, up to the individual table. Um, but first mate is another sort of like the second in command, mm-hmm. uh, you know, the, my number one. Yeah. Right. Yeah, um, one. <laughs> Every, who doesn't want to be Riker stepping over chairs and whatnot? Just you stepping know? over chairs and wooing the ladies. Um, <laughs> 
somebody being in touch somebody with his feelings, the ladies. being in touch with his mm-hmm. feelings. Yeah, quartermaster, someone in charge of supplies. Yeah, they're they're um, an important person. They're, they're the ones that got to do person. the deals when they get in. When you right. get into port, you got to go in and, and you got to wheel and deal and uh-huh. get those they're, supplies. They got to work with the dock master and and get their uh, get their papers signed and sealed and all that other kind of stuff. Real opportunities for bribery, for deception, yeah. for a non-combat sort of charismatic focused character to be a, a quartermaster. Yeah. Um, there's a master of arms, right? Like someone who's in charge of repelling boarders from the ship, leading boarding parties uh, for Tra- the ship. Training the crew. Training the crew, um, that kind of thing. And then the other sort of like master of the watch, someone in charge of security, making sure that the ship is safe when it's in harbor, mm-hmm. uh, that, that people aren't sneaking aboard, that stowaways aren't there, that the people that are supposed to be on watch are actually on watch. Yeah. Those the, are the, some of the, the roles. Bosun, the boat swain. <laughs> the boat swain, the yeah. bosun, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, you know, you can go deep down and and get into uh, the nitty-gritty of, of sort of uh, what's going on I, I I prefer the fast and loose approach yeah right yeah just name a couple of people at the top captain first a officer of people, right and then I, I, I I do like the, the idea of having the entire party be a crew member yeah uh, and and or sorry an officer in the crew therefore yeah. each party member has a certain area that they are in control of yeah and to go back to our our, our most recent experience that's the way y'all kind of had it set up for a while because you were the you were like the master of like whispers, kind of. Yeah, yeah. security. Z- Z- Zelo was security and intel. Yeah, he, he he acquired those two positions for himself. Yeah. Um, no one really knew that he no, was. No one really knew, but that's all right. That's just the kind of person he was. Um, but you know, others we had a ship's counselor. Yeah. Uh, no, we, <laughs> that we, was that was uh, Joseph, the uh, yeah. Audie's character. Audie's character was ship. She was um, Troy. <laughs> and then, uh, of course, the ship technomancer, uh, Josh's uh, Bezalel, Be- trans- uh, Warforged transmuter. Yeah, he was either in there going to save the day or blow up the ship. No blow one really ship. knew. No one really knew. The, the sounds never changed though. <laughs> right. They were loud, cacophonous, <laughs> and constant. Yeah, and I think that, I mean this is a good time to say if you're curious about Spelljammer and you're curious about D and D amongst the stars, space fantasy, science fantasy then everything that would apply to a nautical and or pirate campaign is just dressing yeah. that you then change to run a spell jammer or even just a, like a non D and D based. Yeah. You know, you wanted Star Trek or Star Wars or something like that. Slap some Espergenesis on it. Sure, hyperlanes. I mean, there's a ton of of uh, or you could do like um, uh, Doug from Nerdarchy who's got like all of them at once in his spell jammer campaign. He's like, we'll just throw it all in there. Screw it. And have it. Uh, so I think um, I want to play in that. That's be fun. So uh, <laughs> you know, that's what you can have. You you have uh, this opportunity opportunity for, you know, a really rich interaction between the crew, the yeah. characters and everything, uh, an opportunity for different types of adventures that they feature different sorts of challenges, monsters that are never used, and the fact that you could be pirates. I would say, you know, if, if you're going for like the classic Pirates of the Caribbean sort of feel, mastering commander, then, then you know, consider bringing guns into your game. Well, pirates have guns. I'm sorry. <laughs> like, when you think about that... That era, right? They all had guns. That particular era, yes. That particular era, they yeah. had they had their little pistols. They had like six of them. Right. You're just oh. a mu- guy with a musket in the crow's nest, picking people off. I, I I would say that you know obviously everybody's different, and guns are a very controversial subject in D and D, and and obviously real world opinions about them and feelings about them in, intrude on that. And so it's one of those things where you want to kind of like make sure yeah. everybody's on board. But I would encourage it just for the feel of it. Yeah, and if you want a different feel, then go more the gray joys, like we we're talking about, like more right. Scandinavian, you know the like, ah, I forgot how to talk for a second. <laughs> like the Vikings coming down, uh-huh. raiding fishing villages along the coast right. and going in, in coming li- up the river. Coming up and, rivers. Yeah. And yeah. Y- you can go that way. And yeah. there's nothing wrong with that. No, not at um, all. Uh, we've talked about Spelljammer. What are some other fantasy settings for pirate themed? Uh, to, to me, the big one is the Lazar Principalities in Eberron. Yeah. It's sort of a uh, you know collection of islands just off a coast. They have their own sort of political structure that's different from the rest of Corvair. Um, it's sort of along a major trade route, so you have yeah. several dragon mark houses that are constantly sending ships and, and airships and everything through there. There's a un- rich sort of underwater culture of Triton and sea devils and merfolk and everything that, that are there uh, for you to interact with. So you have the, above the waves and below the waves, and I think that that offers a really interesting possibility. I've always wanted to run a campaign where you were playing like uh, agents of one of the dragon mark houses on like a, a fast attack ship. Yeah. And you're there to protect the other ships from pirates within the area. Yeah. And you have to deal with the fact that you're not a government entity. There are princes and principalities mm-hmm. that are that are there. 
um, and that you have to navigate with and, and, and deal with and, and, and potentially oppose, mm -hmm. um, but you have the backing of your dragon marked house. Uh, I think that could be really fun. Another example is just the Sword Coast, right? Like It's the Sword Coast, it's right? It's the Sword Coast. There's like five or six cities up and down the Sword Coast. They all trade with one another. Where there is trade on the ocean, there are pirates. And where there are pirates on the Sword Coast, there's uh, Captain Dudamont and the Sea Sprite <laughs> right. there to thwart them at every turn. There to thwart them. Uh, and I, you know, pirate hunting is another great one. Everything yeah. that we've mentioned here about, uh, you know, about that, that applies to a pirate hunting campaign where the PCs are sort of good guys and, and you know, maybe have the, the blessing of, of the masked lords of Waterdeep to go out mm -hmm. there and clear the sword coast of pirates. And yeah. you start from ten towns and go all the way down to Kalimshan and just uh, clear the area of the coast, mm -hmm. all the little coves and inlets. And, yeah. Yeah. Until halfway through the campaign, the pirates set you up and you take out a normal ship and then you have become the pirates now. And then now, you have become the pirates hunted. now. Yeah, and then there's and then you have to deal with the one that's got the beholder captain that uh, disintegrates a piece of your hull. And, oh. yeah, there's a lot of different uh, things that you can uh, do with that. Uh, so yeah, pirate campaigns, love them. Uh, I, I would, uh, it's been a long time since I've had a chance to run something like that or, or play in it, but they're always on the back of my mind. Um, and, you know, if, yeah. I, I don't have any specific, like, fifth edition resources that I could point to for it, uh, yeah. other than sort of sources of inspiration found in other media that, uh, that sort of capture the feel yeah. of what a pirate campaign is. Right, so uh, gaming at a big show. Now this would be the biggest convention I've ever gamed at. I'm used to much smaller conventions. Yeah. Uh, you know, in the hundred or so people range. Um, the, the, I think probably the biggest one is that you have a limited amount of time and you're gaming with people you don't really know really well. So you want to like cut down on all those, all those things that you might otherwise do in a home game. Like bring pre-gins, be ready to keep things moving at a faster pace than maybe uh, you're used to. Yeah. And um, cut down on the dick jokes. Right. <laughs> or not. Or don't. Or I mean, not. you gotta. It's just, you, you gotta just work the more, room. More than that. Um, know your audience is more. I guess the more. Know important your thing. audience. Um, so I don't know. I think that uh, gaming at a convention is a great way to game with a lot of people you don't otherwise get a chance to to play with. And you can play games that you don't usually get to. Yeah. My favorite thing to do at a convention is like this: is like play a game that I don't know real well. Right, right. Uh, just to get a taste for it. What, what game would you want? What would you want to play here? I mean, if this were a dedicated tabletop convention, not just like the big hits, I'd want to play something like Blades in the Dark. Yeah, yeah. Um, that'd be one. Um, there's some others, maybe. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't mind trying out something like Seventh Sea or something like that. I've never really played those before. Right, right. So. But we're gonna try to get a game going here in a couple hours. Find a table. Yeah. You uh, park it. What do you bring? What do you bring into the table, Jim Davis, with your game? I think I'm going to run a continuation of the Razzle Sin game that uh, told from the perspective of the. Or not, I guess not told. But like the players take on the role as like agents of the hag. Oh my! Uh, and so we're going to play. Uh, we're going to play a little something like that, trying to resurrect her orcish son uh -huh. in order to visit retribution upon the uh, upon the party and their allies. So, well, yeah, because they've been uh, they've been putting a thumb in, in the eye of her plans, even though they haven't. We didn't really do much to hurt her. Not her, but you did ruin her plans that were 13 years in the making, at least. I mean, that's got to burn a little bit, that right? That stings. Yeah. That stings. Anybody doing anything for a baker's dozen of years, you know? Right, but she's got you know backup plans and contingencies and yeah, the yeah. like. Uh, and that's what we're going to play through in this one. So we're, we're playing the backup plan to the backup plan that backs up the backup plan. Basically, yeah. So Outcast would be happy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and we've got, they're not all, uh, you know, it's not like a, they're not, everybody's not evil, right? Like of the pregens that I made. But it is a... Uh, so does that mean that they're possible unwitting? Kind of. No, they know who they work for. They just don't see her as uh, a wicked person. Ah. Uh, she's more of a, uh, see, they, they see her more as a force of nature, or right, uh, right. a harsh but uh, but fair mistress. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, it's like being mad at, you know, thunderstorms. Right, exactly. I mean, yes, they seem vindictive, but it's part of life, There's no right? point in getting that mad at Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. 